So the 2005 season was known for a few things. Number one, changes to the aero on the front and the rear. Number two, you had to use the same set of tyres for the race and for qualifying. You know, you weren't allowed to change the tyres at all, you just had to pop more fuel in. Number three, it was the end of the Schumacher years. And number four, that catastrophe that happened at Indianapolis. Oh yes, that word is back. But there was something else going on. One of those genius hacks that one team was able to exploit pretty well before it got banned. But it's how it got banned that's the funny thing, if you believe the story that is. And that is the story of Renault's mass dampers. Also this video is going to be mostly talking head with pictures of the cars and like footage of it going around a track in a set of course or that sort of thing because actual pictures of the mass dampers I can use are hard to come by. If I do find any while in the process of doing the edit of this I'll pop them in but if there aren't any like creative commons is all I can use so I don't want to get stung again. As I mentioned at the top of this video, and in a video looking at the rules in general, I looked at the changes in the aero rules between 2004 and 2005. The most obvious aero change being the fact the front wing was raised by 50mm to reduce downforce, with teams coming up with their own methods to get past the gaps in the rulebook. Chief among which being that central part of the front wing forming a scoop shape that went below the main plane of the front wing. This means that teams had to run stiffer springs at the front end to compensate for that lost downforce, which had a bit of an unwanted side effect. They couldn't hit curbs as hard as they would have done before. Now curb hopping, like the kind of thing you'll see in the BTCC as they go through Duffer's Dip at Knock Hill or V8 Supercars at Gold Coast, it can't really be done in Formula 1 cars. The suspension on an open wheeler is mega stiff by comparison and the suspension is way more fragile. And while a GT3 car could hit the sausages on the inside of the two left-handers of the Ascari chicane at Monza, an F1 car has to stay the hell off, or your suspension will just go into orbit. See Gasly at Austria a couple of years ago. Or was it Kvyat? Or was it Hartley? I mean, it was a Toro Rosso or an Alfa Tauri either way. And with teams trying to run as low ride heights as possible to generate that front end grip, you'll hear on many occasions engineers coming on the radio telling drivers to stay off the curbs at certain corners because they're risking front wing damage. So Renault noticed this performance drop in instability and then decided to do something about it. Ballast would be carried to bring the cars up to minimum weight, 650 kilos as it was in 2005, and Renault decided that their little fix for the instability going over curbs and bumps would also act as ballast. What it was, was a weight suspended in a bell-shaped chamber that hung freely but had some springs either side or top and bottom that could be adjusted, and this bell-shaped thing was placed in the nose cone just behind the front wing end plate. I found a drawing of it on Wikipedia that I can use and I've gone and placed it on this model of the 2005 car to give you an idea of where it would actually be placed. But what's interesting is that this isn't the first time that this has been tried in racing, at least if you believe the stories of the time that is. If you've been a viewer here a while you'll know that the BTCC Super Touring era is probably my favourite era of racing, which probably comes with a modicum of nostalgia tax and other things, but it is claimed that in around 1998 or so teams were spending something in the region of £5 million per car, and Ford was spending 150 grand on gluing the windscreen wiper in a specific place for aero. Peugeot was running this, Honda was doing this, Nissan had some sort of hack, and it's claimed that the Renault Lagunas of that time, which were run by the Williams F1 team, or at least prepped by the Williams F1 team, were running an early version of what became the mass dampers used by Alonso and Fisichella. And as an addition here, by doing some more research, it appears that Citroen was using tuned mass dampers on the 2CV as early as 1948, and the original patent for a tuned mass damper was filed in 1912, 110 years ago. Now originally this weight inside the bell chamber was about 10 kilos, but Renault spent a lot of money and spent a lot of research time getting it just right. But then they realised that they could chop and change the weight depending on the sort of track that they went to. And while this is seen as being a 2005 innovation by Renault, they weren't using it until later on into the 2005 season, the Italian Grand Prix to be precise, but they were testing it on and off throughout 2005 and maybe even through 2004 as well. But the other teams were perplexed by this system, and it wasn't until they saw Fisichella and Alonso's cars on the TV cams that they realised what was going on. 
And you don't need to be an aerospace engineer to see it for yourself. Pull up any footage from late into 2005 or better yet, into the 2006 season. Whenever, say, Schumacher, Button, Montoya, Weber or whoever go over the exit curves at corners, the T-cam on top of the car shakes like hell. When the Renaults went over the curbs, nothing. Silky smooth. Like running at 24 frames a second 240p versus 120 frames a second 4k. So, needless to say, the other teams had to build their own version to keep up. Some of the teams did get a system of their own hooked up, but they were way behind what Renault was able to achieve. The Michelin teams were able to get more average performance gains thanks to the tread blocks of the Michelin tyres moving around more compared to the stiffer Bridgestones. But at the 2006 German Grand Prix, the other teams had basically had enough of developing their own system and then filed protests with the FIA saying that the mass damper constituted a movable aerodynamic device. You might think then that the first team to protest the system would have been the red team, but it wasn't. It was actually McLaren, which is ironic given that Ron Dennis had said about that magical third brake pedal in the 90s that other teams should just build their own instead of stop crying that they can't build their own or can't be bothered spending the money or can't figure it out or, you know, words to that effect. But Renault and Ferrari had managed to get a system working. Ferrari's wasn't as good as Renault's, but they were able to close the gap to around two tenths of a second per lap or something in that region. And Ferrari and Renault were working on putting the mass dampers in the back as well as the front to get some more you know, dampening. But the difference is the R26 that Renault had entered into the Formula 1 World Championship in 2006 was built with the mass dampers in mind. The Ferrari, the 248, wasn't. In all, Ferrari, Renault, Red Bull, Midland and Toro Rosso had got a mass damper system that actually got raced. Honda was about to debut their system, but because of the protests at the German Grand Prix, they never went ahead with it. Other teams were developing a system, but teams like McLaren didn't bother developing one at all. Renault maintained that the mass damper was a mechanical device. For all intents and purposes, it was part of the suspension, you know, part of the heave springs, but other teams weren't having it probably because the damper wasn't installed as part of the suspension and was installed as part of the nose cone assembly. Renault avoided using the system at the German Grand Prix despite the stewards at Hockenheim saying it was kosher, but the whole thing was overturned at the Court of Appeal about a month or so later. The FIA had basically decided that the mass damper wasn't a mechanical device and was actually used more to affect the aerodynamics of the car. The FIA's reasoning is that the mass damper could present a safety hazard as well because it was contained inside the nose cone and the nose cone is designed to basically disintegrate upon impact. They were worried that it was going to fly off and if teams were using heavier and heavier weights for each track then it could fly off into the crowd, hit a driver in the face, that kind of thing and it could all get pretty messy if that thing ended up somewhere it shouldn't. There was also the clarification under Article 3.15 of the technical regulations under aerodynamic influence that... Any specific part of the car influencing its aerodynamic performance must be rigidly secured to the entirely sprung part of the car, having no degree of freedom, and must remain immobile in relation to the sprung part of the car. And since the mass damper hung freely inside that bell chamber and moved around as the car moved around, it was actually contravening the rulebook. Pat Simmons at Renault said, Whatever we might gain on the aero side is less than 10% compared to a simple measure to our conventional suspension setup. While the FIA said, while its view in the past had been that they do not contravene the technical regulations, recent evidence and an escalation in development by some teams has made it clear to us that the principal purpose of these devices is to improve the aerodynamic performance of the car. And we've actually seen this kind of thing before with Brabham's fan car. Even though you know, I know, we all know that that fan on the back was to provide maximum suck, designer Gordon Murray basically proved to the FIA that the fan did more to cool the engine than it did to suck the car to the ground. On this occasion though, the FIA saw that the gains in aero performance were way more than the mechanical performance, and it was finally outlawed. Although, there is an alternative reason as to why the mass dampers were banned. Now, this is a story that's been thrown around a lot on the internet and it might just be one of those Mandela effect things. It might have been mentioned on the internet so many times that it became the truth or it might just be so plausible because the Renault team principal at that time was a certain Mr. Briatore. So, like the McLaren testing on an oval and doing laps for banter story that I did last week, it probably is totally made up. But, when I'm done, you'll probably see why this could actually be true. 
The story goes is that the teams met up to discuss the possible banning of the mass damper. They'd spent a boatload of money to make their own without any of the returns that Renault was getting, while at the same time going, uh, lads, this is movable aero, isn't it? Now in these instances, the votes require a unanimous vote, with Ferrari being able to veto, obviously, and Renault presented their case to the FIA, the teams presented their case against the mass dampers to the FIA. Until Briatore mentioned what he must have thought was a great compromise. It's alleged that Briatore said, okay, if you want these mass dampers for your cars and you know mass dampers for your cars that work, you'll have to buy them from us because we've just submitted a patent for them or just had the patent approved depending on where you're reading the story from. It was then that the other teams went, right, who's in favour of banning the mass dampers? Like I said, it's probably a load of tosh, but if it is true, it's probably the most briatory moment of them all. So what you've got here then is a look at the controversial mass dampers that Renault ran through the 2005 and 2006 seasons. And if you've learned something new here today, be sure to leave a like or leave a algorithm friendly comment saying that you, you know, enjoyed the video or learned something new here today in the designated comment subscription zone underneath this video. And if you're not already, make sure you get subscribed and make sure you get that bell on so you never miss out on anything that I do here, as good or bad as it is. Massive thanks as ever to the fine folk of Patreon. If you want to join them in supporting me on a more personal level, links to Patreon as well as Discord and all my social media will be in the description of this video. So until next time, I've been Aidan Mord. Have a great day wherever you live in the world. I'll see you all again soon for another video. Bye.